name is Ranger Chelsea. We're back at Redcliffe Plantation for part two of our Discover Carolina school tours. Uh, just a reminder, all 47 state parks are still closed, but rangers and park staff are working really hard behind the scenes to bring you some virtual programs every day. So definitely check back on our social media, follow our Facebook pages, and look out for those future programs that are gonna be posted each day by the State Park Service uh, at various parks throughout South Carolina. So today, I'm hoping you're coming back for part two of our Discover Carolina School Tour. Uh, if you haven't already, go back and watch the first video that we posted that focused on the slave cabin. So this tour focuses on what life was like in a 19th century plantation, like here at Redcliffe. The first part focused on what life was like for the enslaved peoples who worked and toiled this land and cultivated those crops under James Henry Hammond, their owner. Part two today is gonna to focus on how people lived in the mansion, the Hammond family, the slave owners, what their life was like. And we're gonna do a tour of the rooms at Redcliffe Mansion. So once again, if you haven't watched the first part, go back and find part one of our Discover Carolina school tour programs. Uh, and this is where we're gonna finish up that. So today, uh, we are going to head into the mansion in just a minute. But before we get started, let's just do a quick overview again, in case it's been a little bit since you watched that first video. Let's describe what a plantation is, because that's where we're at today. A uh, plantation is a large farm or estate that grew and cultivated crops. Uh, agriculture was very significant to the South's economy, especially in the 1700s and 1800s. The five main cash crops of South Carolina were cotton, corn, tobacco, indigo, and rice. So James Henry Hammond, the owner of this site, primarily made his money from cotton. We're also gonna be learning today using primary sources. We went over this in part one of our tour also. Primary sources are basically anything, artifacts, objects, documents, buildings like the one we're standing on today that date back to the time we're studying. So we're studying primarily the 1850s and 1860s. So this mansion here is a primary source. We're going to be looking at other documents as well that date back to that time. So we're going to get started. We're going to head into the main hall here and start our tour of the mansion. So we are in the main hall of Redcliffe's mansion. Um, if you watched part one, you'll remember this structure was completed in 1859 and built by Hammond's enslaved peoples, enslaved workers that he had here. The cabins were 1857 and the site was purchased in 1855. So we're in the 1850s still. Here in the mansion, we're gonna see how the elite class lived. Now, since this is part two, we're gonna be doing a lot of comparisons. We already went through the slave cabin. We saw what life was like for the enslaved. So as we move through spaces in this mansion, we're gonna be doing a lot of comparisons of how the White Hammond family lived compared to the enslaved peoples. So let's start with talking about that elite class that Hammond was a part of. As I mentioned, agriculture was huge for the South. Hammond was a statesman. He served in various political postings. He helped make laws. Uh, he worked in the House, he served in the House, he was a governor, and he was a United States Senator. And he very much advocated for slavery, and uh, he made a lot of his money from that slave labor that cultivated his cotton fields. So, um, <clears throat> you might hear a Kubota in the background, we still got work going on in the plantation, even though we're closed. Um, but he, la he made a lot of his money from the slave labor that was picking cotton fields. So what does that elite class mean though? It means it's a group of people who had wealth, influence, and power. And Hammond was very much a part of that. And he's famous for that cotton is king phrase. You might have heard that before. He didn't invent the phrase, but he made it famous because he gave it in one of his Senate speeches in 1858 while he served as a United States Senator. And I'll just read a small line from that speech that you may have heard before, but Hammond says, you dare not make war upon cotton. No power on earth dares make war upon it. 
Cotton is king. So why does Hammond say this? Cotton is king. Is he taking a bunch of cotton balls and putting a crown on it and bowing down to it? No. I mean, maybe. He did a lot of weird things in his spare time. But we don't think that's what it was. Uh, he's saying cotton is king because Hammond knows the South at this time, as things are really ramping up and getting hostile and volatile between the North and the South, he knows men like him in the South have so much power because of what they grow. They grow cotton and those other cash crops. And the world and the rest of the country needs that cotton. And that's how they get money in the South, from selling those goods. And they know they have power and leverage because of what they are providing to the world. So that's what he means when he says cotton is king. The South has a lot of leverage as things are leading to war because of that. So we are going to tour the rest of the mansion, the first floor rooms, and see how that level of success and wealth that came from the agricultural economy um, that came to many planters in the South who owned slaves and land, how that enabled them to live. We're going to see that through looking through these spaces. So this is the parlor. We don't really say parlor anymore in our houses, or I don't. Uh, but this is kind of the equivalent to a living room, a living room space. This is where Hammond would have, and his family would have entertained a lot of their guests in this space. So as you take a look around, how is this living room similar or different to your living room? What's in your living room that's not in this room? Well, a big one is probably a television. I have a television in my living room. Uh, thanks to my husband, we have multiple game consoles in our living room, which we don't really use to entertain others, but more to entertain ourselves. Um, maybe a stereo or a Bluetooth speaker. Um, that's what we would use for entertainment as well. I don't have a piano, which a piano would have provided music. That's how they would have had entertainment for guests. Members of the Hammond family, especially the daughters, would have been able to play the piano. Also, artwork is a key thing we see throughout this house, especially in this room. Um, I have artwork in my living room. Maybe you have artwork throughout your house. This painting here is the largest in our collection, the largest painting. It's a copy of Raphael's Transfiguration of Christ, the original in the Vatican. Uh, Hammond and his family had so much money, he could afford to pay an Italian artist to make him a personal copy of that original painting in the Vatican. He saw it on a trip there, loved it, so he got a copy of it. So artwork, music, discussion, people probably talked to each other a lot more back then. That's what you would have been doing in a living room space back, back then. And you have some of your nicest pieces and artwork in your parlor because that's where you have most guests, that in your dining area. All right, we're going to head to our next room. We're back in my favorite room, the library. If you tuned in last week, or maybe even the week before, we did our first tour um, via Facebook, and it was kind of a behind the scenes tour. We took out a lot of old books. So you know I love old books if you saw that tour. Thank you for tuning back in. Uh, but here, we're gonna talk a little bit about education. Uh, this is the library. We have about 2,000 books. Uh, and once again, that shows the level of wealth that this family had. Books were expensive back then. And to have this many, especially a lot of old first editions, uh, it speaks to the level of wealth that the Hammond family had. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about school. We know what schooling was like for some of the Hammond children based on some primary sources. Uh, this here is Betty Hammond. And we have a letter from Betty where she talks a little bit about school. And a letter from Betty when she was about nine years old said, my father bought a home in Beach Island and named it Redcliffe. We moved there in May, 1855. 
I was five and a half years old. My mother had taught me to read before I was five years old. So from that letter, we learned several things about Betty. One, James Henry Hammond is her father. She says her father bought a home in Redcliffe in 1855. We also learn that it was her mother who taught her how to read and that Betty was less than five years old when she learned how to read. We also know from various other documents that Betty's education continues until about the age of 17. Right after uh, the age of five, maybe around six or seven, Betty, had, Betty and her sister, Caddy, they had governesses. Governesses back then were kind of at-home teachers, people that the Hammond family would have hired to come and teach their children at home. And then when Betty's about 12 or 13, we know she starts attending school elsewhere. We know one of the schools Betty attended was in Augusta, Georgia, and it was a school run by a Mrs. Sedgwick. And we have another primary source here that confirms that. And it is an advertisement for Mrs. Sedgwick's school. This is from an Augusta Chronicle article from the 1860s. And it mentions that Mrs. Sedgwick's school is starting up again. There are three terms, what the cost of the term is, and what the subjects are that are being taught. And we know from Betty attending that school that she learned Latin, German, French, musical instruments, and vocal musical instruction. So a variety of subjects Betty learned. I pulled out some old books, because you know I love to do that by now, that would have dated back to Betty's time. We don't know if she actually used these, but maybe her brothers did, or maybe she did. Remember, clean dry hands are okay for books or gloves. This here is an early 1800s, is this the English grammar? Yes, this one is. And it's super old. And we know some later members of the Hammond family use this as well. Catherine Hammond is in here. I won't go too far into this book because it's pretty fragile. But we also have a French grammar. And a Latin grammar that dates to the early 1800s, 1858, so mid 1800s. So these are some educational books or textbooks that they may have used. Now, Betty's education ends at about 17. We know she finishes schooling. Uh, she marries a couple years later. That's pretty normal for young girls of the elite class back then. Um, her brothers, though, she had three brothers, Harry, Edward, and Span. Harry, no, Paul, there's a Paul in there, sorry. There's so many Hammonds. Um, but all three of them would have went to college after they finished education as well, or that, that education up to 17 years old. Their subjects probably would have included more history and mathematics as well. God forbid you teach the girls math. Um, they didn't get to learn that. Uh, and afterwards, they all went to separate colleges as well. So schooling looks a little different whether you're a girl or a boy back then. Uh, but that kind of brings me back to another subject. Who lived on the plantation, if you remember, who wasn't allowed to have an education? The enslaved peoples. They were not allowed to read or write, and they were not allowed to go to school. Work was their main function here on the plantation. So we had a letter from Betty telling us about what she learned and when she moved to Redcliffe. We don't have letters from the enslaved peoples at Redcliffe because they didn't know how to read or write because they weren't allowed to learn how to read or write. So just keep that in mind. When we learn about certain people who lived here at Redcliffe, we don't always have firsthand documents from them because maybe that wasn't available to them or they didn't know how to read or write and that was intentional. All right, we're gonna move across the hall to our next room. So we are in the main bedroom on the first floor 
And we don't have to do the whole potty talk again. We did that on our first tour, but just a quick rundown. This is your wash stand area. You have your cold water pitcher, warm water pitcher. Enslaved individuals would have been filling that up. This is where you wash your face, soap, brush your teeth. Um, and it's kind of important to notice with these objects out here when we compare it to the slave cabin. In the slave cabin, you have the bare necessities, the minimum required. In this home, we've seen luxuries. We have bare minimum as well as additional objects that just make life more comfortable. Uh, this is a really cool piece I wanted to bring out. We don't normally have this out on tour, but this is a perfume bottle that dates to the 1830s to the 1850s, and it's just a beautiful piece. Now, a weird thing, you might see old perfume bottles in museums, maybe online, that date back to the 1800s, and they'll be referred to as toilet water. Now, rest assured, they weren't filling up these perfume bottles with water from toilets. They didn't have running water then anyway, uh, but that's just what perfume was referred to as. Um, but that's just a really pretty piece. I wanted to show that to you guys on this tour. And throughout this room too, we see other ornate furniture. We have a wardrobe here, because there's not really closets. We have Catherine Hammond's portrait actually here. That's James Henry Hammond's wife. So she lived at Redcliffe and she outlived Hammond by about 30 years. So she continued to live here through the 1890s. And then behind me, we have this massive, luxurious canopy bed. Uh, once again, in the slave cabin, we had stuffed sacks on the floor. Here, we have nicer mattresses and huge bedroom furniture. Very tall, kind of to match the tall ceilings that you see in plantation homes. All right, we're gonna head into our last room on this tour. So this is our dining room. This is where the Hammonds would have been eating their meals. Uh, we don't have a kitchen building left, unfortunately, because back then your kitchens were actually not in the plantation house. They would have been in a separate building. Ours did not survive. Rose Hill has an excellent kitchen building though. Maybe you saw her bit there video uh, with Stephanie, the interpreter there. Uh, we have the dining room area though, but we don't have those original kitchens from the 1850s. But we can definitely see a lot of differences in this space when compared to the slave cabin out back. Um, just to quickly remind everyone, we went over the foods that were allotted to the enslaved individuals. And those foods included cornmeal, pickled pork, uh, sweet potato, vegetables, cornbread, and dumplings. And that was kind of repeated every day and every week. That was the same food allotment. Um, luxuries like sugar and coffee were maybe only given to the enslaved peoples once a year. And that was at Christmas, if Hammond deemed them worthy of receiving those extra gifts. I drink coffee every day, so if I got coffee once a year, I wouldn't be a happy camper. Um, but the enslaved peoples, they only got that once a year. However, it's quite obvious that the Hammond family ate very differently than the enslaved families. And we can see that just from the, uh, the, excuse me, the variety of dinnerware and eatery that we find in our collection. So we have not just bare plates um, that may have been made of wood or carved out of wood or clay that the enslaved individuals would have used. We have very ornate gold leaf engraved dishes, um, pieces of silver. This is a dish just for bread. This is a piece for butter. We have this beautifully elaborate um, teacup set. We have your pitcher for tea, your pitcher for coffee, uh, cream, and this is for sugar. And once again, some more elaborate pieces here. Um, a terrine for sauces or gravy. And then I might have skipped over this platter. This actually has Hammond's name engraved on it and it's uh, plated with gold. 
as well. So large variety. And who would have been cooking all of this food? Who would have been making the food that goes on these dishes? It definitely wasn't anyone in the Hammond family. It would have been one of their enslaved workers. And we actually know who the cook was from Redcliffe Plantation, because we have that in Hammond's records. And this over here is actually a blown up copy, another primary source here, of the purchase uh, receipt for Jane Bynes. Jane Bynes was the cook at Redcliffe, and I'm gonna read the following. On the top right corner, usually on these purchase receipts for enslaved peoples, you have the city or location, which this was Augusta, so Augusta, Georgia, and the date of purchase, 18th of May, 1836. And it says, receipt of James H. Hammond, $1,100 in full for a Negro woman and her two children, Caroline and Davy, all of whom I warrant to be sound and healthy. And then signed by Samuel Bones. So this shows that just like when you go to the market, when you go to purchase anything, you get a receipt for what you purchased. That happened for human beings as well. So we have a ton of records that show those receipts of purchase. And we know Jane Bynes was a cook at Redcliffe Plantation. So she would have been making these meals for the Hammond family. Now she wouldn't have been able to make the same meals for the Hammond family that she provided for her own children, Caroline and Davy, because we saw what that slave allotment of food looked like. And it was very different than what, have, than what would have been prepared for the Hammonds themselves. So once again, just keep that in mind, the comparisons of what we see here and what we see just 30 yards out back in the backyard in the slave cabin spaces. But this is the last room of our tour. That pretty much sums it up. Thank you for joining us for part two of our Discover Carolina tours. Uh, we will definitely be posting more videos in the near future. If you have any questions about today's program or Red Cliff Plantation or State Parks, drop them in the comments. We'll try to answer them by the end of the day. And please keep checking back at the State Parks page and Instagram pages. We're gonna be posting more virtual tours and programs every day. Thanks for joining us.